Memoir of the Reverend William C. Burns, M.A., Missionary to China from the English Presbyterian Church, by the late Reverend Isley Burns, D.D., Professor of Theology, Free Church College, Glasgow. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions or hardships. Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. This was printed in 1873. This book will be read in half-hour sections, regardless of where the chapters stop. I will tell you the page number that I stop at. This will be done for convenience sake, since some of the chapters can be quite long. This is being read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God. Prefectorial note. This edition of the memoir, as the title page indicates, is a posthumous one. Its loved and lamented author has passed within the veil to be the sharer, we may not doubt, of his sainted brother's joy, as he had been the follower of his faith and the loving, like-minded memorialist of his work as a servant of the Lord Jesus. He has not been spared to complete, as he had begun, the revisal of the volume or to see it in its new form. He continued at work upon it as long as he was able, and he had made considerable progress. When at last his strength failed him, his master's summons came, and the pin dropped from his hand. The remaining part had to be provided for otherwise, and it was in compliancy with a wish expressed by him a day or two before his death that I undertook to do what he left undone, aided by the suggestions of those nearest to him with whom he was wont to take counsel and who knew his mind best, the disadvantage attending a publication thus posthumous to so very limited extent will not, I trust, be found to be considerable. His endeavor was, and mine has been, while diminishing as much as possible the size of the volume, so as to bring it within the reach of a wide circle of readers to whom the possession of it, at least, has hitherto been unattainable. To diminish as little as possible its value or its interest, perhaps even to increase the latter, by abridging those parts of it while are least personal to its subject, and so rendering it even more distinctively than it was a biography of William Burns. The details of his work in China, as well as the statements of his missionary brethren in regard to it, in which there has been most abridgment, are no doubt in the estimation of some superior in interest to anything else and to the value of the information thus supplied the strongest testimony has been borne from many quarters, but that class of readers is not, comparatively, a large one, and the pain of excision in those parts of the volume has been greatly lessened by the consideration that, in its unabridged form, it is still accessible and is intended to be kept in circulation as heretofore. It was even more painful to be under the necessity of curtailing the extracts from his journal of mission work at home at Dundee in Edinburgh in the highlands and elsewhere, in which home readers would naturally take the deepest interest, all the more in the knowledge of what a mass of equally interesting matter remains behind almost untouched. But this has been done also as sparingly as might be. The best parts have all been retained, while the samples given are such as to convey a faithful, if not a full idea of the whole. What the author says in his prefix to the first edition, was his single aim. He did, by common consent, to a wonderful degree, succeed in accomplishing, to present a true and lifelike portrait of him whose footsteps he had undertaken to trace. And what was true of the work before will be found scarcely, if at all, less true of the work still, so that the dead he may yet speak, just as he spoke while he was with us, to the praise of that divine grace which he so greatly manifested and by which alone, as he so profoundly felt, he was what he was. J.C.B. Free Church, Mays, Kirkliston, 1873. Author's Prefix. The difficulty I anticipated in writing the biography of one so nearly related to me was very soon forgotten. As I proceeded with my task and felt more and more deeply how utterly insignificant are all such earthly ties in presence of the higher relations of that eternal kingdom in which my lamented brother so 
entirely lived. If while he was still with us it was possible for those most closely connected with him in some measure to know him after the flesh, one instantly felt so soon as he had passed within the veil that henceforth we could know him so no more. The materials from which the narrative have been drawn are, first, my own personal recollections and those of other intimate friends, second, private letters addressed chiefly to members of his own family, and third, copious journals extended over the whole period of his own ministry, and continued, though in a briefer and more fragmented manner, during the early years of his residency in China. From these last I have quoted very largely, but not more so, I believe, than those who are really interested in his work would wish me to have done. Indeed, the difficulty often was merely to extract from a document which many readers doubtless would have wished to possess entire. To the many friends to whom I have been indebted for valuable materials, I have made acknowledgment in the course of the work at the places where their communications have been used. But I would here specially mention the names of the late Reverend Dr. Burns of Toronto who contributed the tenth chapter the Reverend Duncan McGregory, M.A. of Dundee, and the Reverend Dr. Kirkpatrick of Dublin, who furnished the graphic sketches of my brother's labors in Edinburgh and Dublin, and the Reverend Car Carstairs Douglas, M.A. of Amoy, to whose loving and painful endeavors I am indebted for almost all the precious memorials from China which enrich the closing chapters. My single aim has been to present a true and lifelike picture of him whose footsteps I had undertaken to trace, and that thus being dead he may yet speak, just as he spoke while he was with us, to the praise of that divine grace which he so greatly magnified, and by which alone, as he so profoundly found, he was what he was. Free Church, College, Glasgow, December 6, 1869. This book has 21 chapters and an appendix. The appendix starts on page 363. Memoir of the Reverend William C. Burns, M.A., Chapter 1, 1815 to 1832. Early Years. William Chalmers Burns, the subject of the present memoir, was the third son of the Reverend William Hamilton Burns, D.D., minister successively of Dune in Agnes and of Kilsheth in Stirlingshire and was born in the Nancy of the former parish on the first day of April, 1815. It was a quiet and gentle spot, full of stillness and peace, nestling with the adjoining church and graveyard, close within the bosom of a romantic dell, amidst the shadows of ancient trees and the hoarse course of rooks high overhead, which seemed rather to increase than to break the silence. A little beyond reach by a rustic bridge across an arm of the ravine was a gray mansi house of the Erkskins, that's E-R-S-K-I-N-E-S, -E with its antique garden and bowling green and smooth-shaven lawn carrying back the thoughts into the far past as associated in popular tradition with stories of the good superintendent and the brave John Knox. With his tranquil scene, little suggestive of profound spiritual experiences or intense moral struggles were his earliest memories linked to the neighboring cathedral city of Brechin, that's B-R-E-C-H-I-N, too, of which a paternal uncle was then minister and which by the continual coming and going of cousins and common friends had become to us as another home. Our thoughts in after days often reoccur with the fine old church and churchyard in the castle steep and the castle pool and the quaint streets and the fair sunny gardens and the scarlet vested town's officers, the objects to us of continual wonderment, the chief of all, the reverend face and form of the good pastor, whose very look was a benediction, all bright forever in the golden light of childhood. In his sixth year, however, all this was left behind and became as the dreamy reminiscence of a bygone world. In the year 1821, his father was translated to a wider and more stirring sphere, where the family life developed itself henceforth under intenser and more stimulating influences. The village of Kilsyth, that's K-I-L-S-Y-T-H, situated about 12 miles east of Glasgow at the foot 
all the undiluting range of picturesque green hills, the gentler continuation of the more rugged Kamsi uh, Fells, contains a mixed population of handloom weavers, collars, and shopkeepers, which numbered at that time about 3,000 souls, and formed the center of a parish which in its landward part contained about 2,000 more. Here the wheels of life moved more swiftly. There was a greater stir of mind, greater variety of interest, greater impetus and force of existence everywhere, intelligent, moral, social. The chatting groups in the marketplace and at the street corners, the merry song often sustained in full chorus, blending with the sound of the shuttle and the long loom uh, shops, the keen party politics and the strong and even bitter denominational sympathies, the eager and sometimes little ceremonial uh, canvassing of ministers and sermons, the collisions and mutual jealousies of class and class, with all the other well-known instances of the South Country weaving village in the neighborhood of a great industrial and commercial center, formed altogether a scene in strong contrast to the still life of our former home. A little to the south of this little busy hive and separated from it only, by a narrow valley stands the Mansi with its uh, sheltering thickets of plains and beaches and commanding an expensive and beautiful prospect, not only of the valley and the hills, but over a long strath, level as the sea to the far west where the blue summit of Goatfell, Goatfell can be dimly descried from the parlor window in a clear day. Here our second home was established and our deepest and most lasting home affections nourished. It was to us a sacred and blessed spot in every sense, full of quiet pleasures, healthy activities, and gentle uh, charities. A Mansi home and a Mansi home of the best type, in which che cheerful piety, quiet thoughtfulness, and a modest and reverent dignity of speech and carriage formed together the purest element, in which the young life could de develop itself and receive its first impressions of truth and duty. Here, of course, as elsewhere, it was the parent, they made their home, and in this respect I think we were happy beyond the lot of most. Our father, gentle, revered, gracious, full of kind thoughts, devout affections, and full of genteel sympathies, serious without moroseness, cheerful and even sometimes gay without lightness, zealous, diligent, conscientious without a thought of interest, impetus, haste, and caring about with him with all an atmosphere of calm repose and the that measure of dignity, which in these bustling days is becoming increasingly rare. He was the very model of a type of the Christian pastorate, which is fast passing away. The father alike and the friend of his whole parish and the loving center of everything kind and good and true is that is passing within its bounds. To him, our mother was in some respect the direct counterpart of a nimble, buoyant, active frame, alike of body and mind. She was all light and life and motion and was, as it were, the glad sunshine and bright angel of a house which had been otherwise too still and somber. There was not in those days under their roof much direct and sympathetic uh, home education. Their influence and teaching of the place was rather felt or experienced without being felt, then visibly obtruded and pressed upon us. My father's government was rather calm and strong and bustling and energetic, he was a regulated and steadying power rather than a busy executive. He was, in short, felt rather as a presence than seen as an agency. The elements in which we live, the atmosphere which we breathe day by day, sometime, something in short, which was, as it were, presupposed, and in its silent influence entered into everything that was thought, felt, planned, enjoyed, or suffered within our little world. We were not often or much with him, not so much, I think, as would as a general thing be desirable. His calm and unimpulsive temperament here, as elsewhere, fitted him to act rather by continuous influence than by distinct and specific efforts. A casual um, encounter in the garden walk or in the harvest field, a forenoon drive to some neighboring Nancy or country house, half an hour's private reading with his boys, in the study before breakfast, after all, the Sabbath evening hour of catechism and prayer, these with now and then the reading aloud in the fireside circle of some interesting and popular volume, a task in which he greatly divided and much excelled, were the chief occasions of direct intercourse and influence between the father and the child. 
Sometimes, too, along the garden walk at evening time or through a partition wall at midnight, the ejaculated words of secret meditation and prayer would reach our ears and hearts, like the sounding of the high priest's bells within the veil. Footnote. The pastor of Kilsyth, a brief biography of Mr. Burns' father, published some years ago, from which the sketch of the home life at Kilsyth is partly taken. End of the footnote. It was in this way that the first touch of serious thought I ever observed in my brother was brought to light. We had lain long awake in our common sleeping chamber after some months of separation, talking eagerly of all our ideas and plans of life, in which as yet God in heaven had little share. And when the well-known sound from within the sanctuary was heard in the silence, he was hushed at once, at least to momentary silence and seriousness, and whispered, there can be no doubt where his heart is and where he is going. It was not long before the great decisive change took place and may possibly have been the first living seed of grace that sunk into his heart. But the more active management of the household and of their home education was saved in the hands of his more nimble and lively partner who seemed made, if anyone ever was, to make home and home duties happy. Herself the very soul of springy activity and a classic cheerfulness, she kept all around her alive and stirring, while by the infection of her own blithesome and courageous spirit, labor became light and duty pleasant. Never was she so much at home as when, in one of those occasional inundation of friendly kith and kin, to which our large connection and central situation exposed us, the manse became too narrow for its inmates, and double-bedded rooms and extemporized shakedown became the order of the day. Was there now and then, amongst this universal quickness and our, our lessee, a slight tinge of sharpness in chiding the dreamy vulturers and the handless slut? Perhaps so, yet we children scarcely saw it, to whom she ever spoke in the true mother tones of gentleness and love. From her lips and at her knees we learned our earliest lessons of truth, and in her voice and face first traced, as in a clear mirror, the lineaments of that gentle and loving godliness which hath the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Such was the element in which my brother's earliest years were spent and in which his first experiences of life were formed. There was another household with which, second to our own, our most hallowed thoughts of home and of home life were associated, the Mansi of Strathblane, that's S-T-R-A-T-H-B-L-A-N-E, situated about 12 miles from Kilsley, in a quiet valley at the foot of Bolagan, B-A-L-L-A-G-A-N, at the other end of the Kansi Range. Dr. William Hamilton, the head of that household and the father of the better known and well beloved Dr. James Hamilton of London, was my father's ancient friend and in former days had been used while the as assistant minister of a church in Dundee to visit us, especially at communion times, in our old home at Dun. His stated form and a certain almost prophetic majesty of mind and bearing powerfully impressed us, and his image and voice as he paced up and down the Nancy parlor in eager discourse or with rapt airs uh, citating some favorite snatch of sacred song remained ever afterwards a cherished tradition in the family. When in after years the two friends found themselves again established within easy distance of each other, the old relation was resumed and was kept up not only by the official interchange of services at communion time, but by a cordial intimacy between the families which was signalized by occasional comings and goings and bright summer days along the romantic valley between. Those visits were always seasons of high enjoyment and revealed to us a phase of the Christian home which was to us in some measure new. Dr. Hamilton was a man far above the common standard of his class and of his time, alike an intelligent statue and a moral elevation and strength, a ripe scholar, a profound divine, and a minister of singular fever and sanctity. He was characterized at the same time by an enlargement and enlightenment liberty of view in, in regard to all public questions, civil and religious, at once admirable and rare. He was an ardent friend of the missionary cause, while that cause was yet in its infancy, 
and was still suffered the full brunt of the world's scorn. He was a reformer at a time when in nine-tenths of his order, reform associated with ideas of revolution and church destruction was the name of terror. I remember during the days of the reform bill, when the whole land was astir with the excitement and the fear of a movement, which seemed to most of us like an interruption of the uh, uh, Vandals, hearing with dismay how a bannered host of workmen from the Prince Fields in his neighborhood had, had actually, at his own desire, filed to the sound of drum past his mamsey, encamped on the green lawn before the door, and received from the good pastor not only words of kindly counsel and encouragement, but good cheer, also of another more substantial kind. But it was in his study that he was most at home and in his glory. He had a hunger for books, which, fortunately, his ample means enabled him to gratify by the accumulation of stores which overflowed far beyond their proper sanctuary into every available nook and corner of the house and which seemed to us accustomed to more common things, one of the wonders of the world. The spirit of his father infected the children and infused through the air, on, through the place, an air of studious application and still quietude, which was almost uh, colostral. It was the house happy and cheerful withal. The favorite sports and pastimes, indeed, were like everything else about the place of the intellectual cast, but nonetheless on the, that account bright and gladsome. A boyish lecture to the literary society at the neighboring print fields, an animated discussion of the respective merits of Wilberforce and Bromham and Gray and Henry uh, Melville and Dr. Chalmers, or a mock trial and a parlor in the evening in which boys and girls alike bore their share and the several parts of judge, jury, panel, and pleading counsel were sustained with an ability and gravity which alike astonished and confounded us. How vividly do I recall the very look and voice with which a fair and gentle girl, the little one, and the favorite of the family came forward with a blithesome air which sadly belied her grim part, shouting, I am to be the panel. James, of course, was senior counsel for the crown as well as the presiding genius of the whole scene. William, his younger brother, and now a respectable minister of the Free Church, sat dudely bewigged and, and, and glowed as the most reverent judge, while the remaining parts, I am afraid, broke sadly down in my brother's hands and mine. Altogether, it was one of the brightest and holiest spots I ever ever known on earth, a place which angels might well visit or desire to look into in passing by on errands of mercy and grace, so that it seems quite in the natural course of things that there should have proceeded from it the author of The Mount of Olives and the Happy Home. We returned musing many thoughts and feeling that we had got a look into a world to which, accustomed to a more outward and muscular style of life, we had been in great measure strangers. My brother's bent especially at, was at this time decidedly in the muscular direction. He gave far greater promise of becoming a mighty hunter than a deep student bearing the pale hue of thought. Strong of limb and of sanguine temperament, his heart was in the open fields and woods, and in all manner of manly and athletic exercises. He spent long days with his fishing rod on the Karan water on the outer side of the hills, along with a congenial friend from the village. He wandered for hours along the hedges and through the fields with an old cabaret borrowed from the village blacksmith in search of sparrows and crows. He was famous for lifting up his axe upon the thick trees, at one time clearing the whole precincts of the superficial growth of years by his unaided strength. He did yeoman service on occasion in the hay or cornfields, and was in great respect by the minister's man when a sudden emergency called for the aid of a volunteer force. I do not remember at any time any books which greatly interested him except those two, The Pilgrim's Progress, which he read over and over again during a time of confinement occasioned by an accident, and The Life of Sir William Wallace, brought, bought with half a crown given him when a very little boy by Dr. Hamilton. There were, however, few books then fitted to arrest the attention and stir the minds of the young, and especially of boys. There were no Martin Rattlers or Old Jakes or Tom Browns. Even such as these were, were had in their own outward appearance a most uninviting aspect. The rude engravements of former days had just been banished 
in the interest of high art and good taste, and the more graceful illustrations of present times had not yet come in. Thus, the most enchanting of books had, just at that particular juncture, a most repulsive aspect. The Pilgrim's Progress was without in, in efficiency, even of great Pope or the shepherds on the delectable mountains. Robert Robertson Carew's was without the shady umbrella and the footprint on the shore. Even the Scots Worthy and the Book of Martyrs were mere acres of black type, without one solemn gleam of the gathered faggots and the aspiring flames and of the clasped hands and uplifted eyes of martyr faith in victory. Thus there was comparatively little then to allure or to keep within doors a stirring boy urged by a strong physical impulse towards the open fields and woods. Meanwhile, however, the essential matters of a common school education went on satisfactory. He attended all the time of his residence at home, the parish school of the place, then under the care of the Reverend Alexander Salmon, afterwards of um, Paisley, and Sidney, a teacher of rare intelligence and skill, who was among the first Scottish schoolmasters to avail himself of the modern improved methods of tuition and to substitute an intellectual interest for the old iron sway of the Ferula, F-E-R-U-L-A. I have myself a most vivid recollection of the very time when the grim reign of terror came to an end and the hal halcyon days of lively questioning and kindly moral influence began. We're leaving off on the first part on page 10 at the very beginning. The memoirs of W. C. Burns this is the second part, picking up on the very bottom of page 9. I have myself a most vivid recollection of the very time when the grim reign of terror came to an end and the halcyon, days of lively questioning and kindly moral influence began. Here my brother did his work well and kept a good pace placed in all his classes. He became a good reader and a good arithmetic and accountant and learned, at least in a certain rough way, the elements of Latin without, however, any kindlings of desire after further attainments in the higher learning. His thoughts were still all outward and his highest ambition and declared resolution to be a country farmer like the fathers of most of his school companions and friends. And yet, even then, a touch of deeper feeling would now and then betray itself, which revealed the hidden fire that slumbered within. A touching incident of this I very vividly remember. The population of a dovecot which he owned as his special property had become repugnant, and the decree had gone forth from the higher powers so that some of his favorites, favorites should fall a sacrifice to the public good. Yielding reluctance to the stern necessity, he undertook himself the office of executor, which he deemed would be more mercifully discharged by his own hand than by any other. In planting himself, carabin in hand at the corner of a wall at a little distance, took his aim resolutely, with but trembling at one of the devoted flock perched on the ridge of the house between him and the sky. The shot missed its mark, but unhappily only partially. The poor bird was sore, sorely wounded in the foot, but not killed, and gathering up the broken and bleeding limb beneath its wing, stood on the other, silent and motionless, a spectacle of agony. Instantly his heart smote him for the deed he had done. He was now, to his own sense, no more the executioner, but the cruel murderer. And he stood there, rooted on the spot for hours together, as in bitter penance, blazing up with streaming eyes to the hapless victim, which seemed in its turn to look down reproachfully upon him. The whole scene, which is distinctly before me now, might almost have reminded one of Resbeth, the daughter of Ahai, in her long wait, watch beside the bodies of her slaughtered sons, when she took staff cloth and spread it for her on the rock from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven. A circumstance, however, which now transpired, changed at once the whole course of his thoughts and opened a new 
and, as the event proved, a most monumous, monumous chapter in his life. A material uncle, a respected lawyer in Aberdeen, who happened to visit us at this time, not approving of the farming project, kindly invited William, then in his 13th year, to spend a winter with him and take advantage of the higher training of the grammar, grammar school of the city, then at the very height of its fame, under the distinguished rectorship of the Reverend Dr. James Melvin, then well known within his own sphere, but since his death far more widely, as one of the first classic scholars of his day, and more perhaps than any other man, the reviver uh, in modern times of ex exact scholarship, and especially of Latin scholarship in Scotland. My brother at once felt the fascination of the place and of the man, and caught the breath of a new existence, in which all his old dreams of farming and of a country life vanquished out of sight. He fought his way steadily up the class till he reached the genteel and exuber ex exhilarating air of the highest faction and closed the session as one of the rector's best and most trusted scholars. When he returned home, even after the interval of a college session, his talk was still of Melvin and of the grammar school and was of such an enthusiastic kind as to kindle in me an irrepressibly longing to explore the same Eldorado of golden knowledge and pure classic lore. The effects of the mental discipline thus acquired were lasting and had an important influence on all those habits of rigid accuracy, thorough work, and conscientious regard for rule and law, which ever afterwards distinguished him, while at the same time awakening and training that remarkable faculty for the study of language which stood him in such good stead in the missionary labors of later years. From the school he passed to the university, standing fifth on the list of B-U-R-S-A-R-S, -S, or Open Scholars, in M-A-R-I-S-C-H-A-L College, from among more than 100 competitors. And after two successive sessions, in which he obtained honorable distinctions in all his classes, returned home in the spring of 1831, having completed, as was then thought, his education, and full preparation for the work of his life. The nature of that work he had already chosen. His residence with his uncle at Aberdeen had had naturally enough the same effect upon him as the companionship of farmer's sons at the uh, Kilsif Pars Parsonal School, and he was now accordingly as decidedly set on the profession of the law as before on a country life. His father, who had earnestly desired his dedication to the Christian ministry, gave his reluctant consent, and a few months afterwards he settled with his uncle, Mr. Alexander Burns, a writer to the Signet in Edinburgh, with the view of being bound as an apprentice so soon as the necessary certificates from his college professors could be obtained. But, man proposes, God disposes. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God had girded him for a far higher and nobler work than that which he had chosen for himself, though as yet he did not know him, before all the certificates had arrived, and while yet the last of them was impatiently waited for, a change had taken place in the spirit of his mind, which translated him at once as into a new world, and gave a new direction to his whole afterlife. The extant memorials of the memorable event are not abundant, but explicit and deeply interesting. While William was at Aberdeen, writes an eldest sister, a great change had come over our eldest sister, who from a life of gaiety in Edinburgh during two winters was turned most decidedly with her face Zionwards and left Edinburgh forever. She returned to our quiet Macy, desiring whatever others did, that she might serve the Lord, and from this service she never drew back. But her path was as the shining light shining more and more until the perfect day at P.E.S.T.H. 18th February 1865 when she passed into glory. <clears throat> I think the year 1831 was a year of grace in our family. I remember we began a practice of reading out loud between dinner and tea some religious books. Bridges on the 119th Psalms was our sister's a special favorite and a means of grace. 
On these occasions, dear William, to our sorrow, without saying a word, always slipped out, and he was, to our view, the least likely subject of grace in the family. He always vehemently rejected the idea of being a minister and said he wished to be a lawyer because he saw lawyers rich and with fine houses. Oh, what a contrast his afterlife was to this. For one more conformed to his Savior, in self-denial and voluntary poverty, the world has never seen. At least one who was all this without false uh, self-righteous pride. When, in this spirit, William went to Edinburgh to be bound apprentice to our Uncle A, with the view of being a W.S., we mourned over him as one going to be bound to the world, and this view seemed to have come over his own mind when he found the different kind of society he was thrown into from what he left behind in the Mansi. A joint letter we wrote him, to which he often afterwards referred as one of the chief means of awakening him, had passed from my mind, and a single sentence quoted from it in a letter, of which, of his, which still remains, is all that is left. The first dawn of hope regarding him is to be found in the letter of the date 15, or 5, 5th December, 1831, in which the following for him remarkable words occurred. I am extremely obliged to you for your excellent letter, also to Papa, and I look forward to our correspondency as a thing that shall afford me great pleasure when I am fairly settled away from that dear home where I have enjoyed so many happy days and where in all likelihood I shall never be resident again. I wish you would recommend me to or send me some good religious reading. This request astonished us, and I think we sent him Boston's fourfold estate. Very soon after this, he suddenly and unexpectedly walked in one evening into the dining room at the old mansion with a graver look than was his wont. And in answer to our mother's exclamation, Oh, Willie, where have you come from? His answer was gravely, From Edinburgh. How did you come? I walked a distance of 36 miles. There was then a silence and a standing on the hearth rug. With his back to the fire, he said, what would you think, Mama, if I should be a minister after all? His countenance showed that he was speaking in earnest, and then he told openly how the Lord had arrested him, and that he had no rest in his spirit till he should come home and obtain his parents' consent to relinquish the law and give himself to the service of Jesus in the ministry of the gospel. The inner history of this wonderful change you have in his own diary. This is as I saw it, and far distance as in the day. I remember it vividly, and my feeling was that I was standing in the presence of a miracle. I could not contain my feelings, but rushed along the long passages which led to our father's study, and shutting the door, threw myself on my knees and wept. After being a short time at home, he returned to Edinburgh with our parents' joyful consent to his being what they had longed, wished, and prayed for a minister of the everlasting gospel. By a singular providence, he was free to do so. He had not been bound apprentice, owing to a delay in the arrival of one of the certificates of attendance at college. And it was during this interval that the whole current of his life was changed. It may be right to add that William had been, all along, so far as ever known to me, perfectly free from all outward vice. I never knew of an act of duplicity or a bad word. This, I think, is important to be mentioned, as from his deep views of sin, he, during all the course of his spiritual life, spoke of himself in such terms of self-loathing that those unacquainted with the facts might naturally suppose that he had been turned to God from a life of open sin, as indeed is broadly hinted in an Aberdeen document recently given to the world. Footnote. It may be of more importance for me to state that my own thorough belief is in entire accordance with that here expressed. As a brother nearly of the same age, I had been constantly with him and shared his innermost thoughts, and I always understood from him that he had begun to tread those paths of folly which often lead to open sin, but never passed over the virtue of the precipices. On the contrary, he seemed to regard it as a singular mercy from the Lord, from the effectual call of grace, have come just in time to save him from a ruin otherwise 
as it seemed to him inevitable. End of footnote. Such was the event so far as it could be seen from the outside, even by those who stood the nearest to it. Happily, we have another and still more authentic record of it from his own hand, a, a solemn disposition as before God in regard to a sacred secret, over which before man he ever cast the veil of a deep and reverent reserve. It was drawn forth by a sudden gush of reminiscence when, ten years afterwards, and after his own new life had begun the germ of similar life to thousands of other souls, he unexpectedly found himself in the course of a solitary evening walk in the midst of those scenes which were linked to him with such infinite and deathless memories. Edinburgh, Tuesday, November 16, 1841. Today I chiefly occupied, as far as business is concerned, in preparing for the press the letters I sent some time ago to the Greenside Place School. In taking the air, I walked over scenes which were indeed fitted to speak aloud of mercy of my favored soul. I walked along York Place and looked up to the windows of the room, number 41, west side, upper flat, where, when reading Pike's early piety on a Sabbath afternoon, I think about the middle of December 1831, an arrow from a quiver of the King of Zion was shot by his almighty sovereign hand through my heart, though it was hard enough to resist on theory of means of salvation. Who can understand the feelings with which I again revisited the spot? Alas, the windows in the roof above me met my eyes as the place where a few months afterwards, in 1832, Poor Uncle Alexander died in one day of cholera. Oh, what a contrast between the scenes of mercy and judgment exhibited by God in places so near each other. From this I walked down and revisited my old lodgings, number 69, Brockton Place, Wellington Place, where my earliest days as a child of grace were spent, and where first the Spirit of God shone with full light upon the glory of Jesus as a Savior for such as I was. This was, I think, about the 7th of January, 1832. Although it was then, I remember the light of God first shone fully and transportingly on his word and into my heart. I was never from the beginning three weeks before in utter darkness, but felt that God had been always willing to save me, that I was a self-murderer, and that now he was in his own sovereignty touching my heart and drawing me to himself for his own glory. And again, though about the time mentioned, I remember to have beheld transporting wonders in God's law. Yes, my peace following on this was far different indeed from a settled, quiet frame of mind. I had many fears and many awful struggles with sin and Satan and many sleepless nights of mingling joy and fear and faith and hope and love. Ebenezer, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Wednesday, yesterday morning, I breakfasted with Mr. Bruce and this morning with Mr. Brown, C.J.B., on both occasions, we had interesting conversations. Mr. Bruce seemed pleased to be reminded of old events and promised to give me the dates of several sermons which I was benefited by when preached. The means by which my changed heart was brought about were these, I think. Mr. Bruce's preaching, which engaged me much in the fear of sudden death from the approach of cholera, were preparatory. A letter from my sisters at home in which they spoke in a single sentence of going as pilgrims to Zion and leaving me behind, proved a word in season and touched my natural feelings very deeply. For when sin had rendered me dead to every other feeling, I could not think of my Christian parents and my godly home with all its sweet and solemn privileges without an awful conflict of soul at the thought of parting with them forever. I could think of parting with Christ, for I knew him not. Alas, do I yet know him? but to part with them was too much for me to bear. In this way, the way was prepared, but as yet I am fully conscious that my heart was spiritually dead. However, the set time came. I sat down with solemn impressions arising from the causes now mentioned to read a part of Pike's early piety, which my dear father had given me at leaving home. Ah, little did he know what use God was to make of it. Little did the author of that solemn treatise know one of the purpose for which he wrote it. And in one moment, while gazing on a solemn passage in it, my innermost soul was in one instance pierced as with a dart. God had apprehended me. I felt the conviction of my lost the state rushing through me with re re resistless power. 
I left the room and retired to a bedroom, there to pour out my heart for the first time with many tears and a genuine heart-wrenching cry for mercy. From the first moment of this wonderful experience, I had the inspiring hope of being saved by a sovereign and infinitely gracious God. And in the same instant, almost, I felt that I must leave my present occupation and devote myself to Jesus in the ministry of that glorious gospel by which I had been saved. From that day to this, blessed be Jehovah, I have been conscious more or less deeply of the possession of a new and holy principle, leading me to live by the faith of Jesus to the glory of God and in the communion of the Holy Ghost. Salvation unto our God, who sat upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. The only other extant memorial of this event, eventful time is contained in the following letter to his sisters, written soon after his unexpected visit to Kilslyth, that's K-I-L-S-Y-T-H, and which is the first surviving blossom of the new life that had dawned upon him. Edinburgh, February 20, 1832. My dear sisters, I feel it often a great encouragement to me to persevere in that life upon which I have entered that I do not make for heaven alone, but though there be few that find the straight gate and the narrow way, yet that my nearest and dearest friends upon earth are my fellow pilgrims to the heavenly Cana. Let us encourage and exhort one another in following and trusting in the Lamb who was slain and who now intercedes for all who trust in Him at the right hand of the Father. I have been apt, as it is, I believe, the case with many young Christians to make my safety depend upon my feelings and consequently to feel miserable when not engaged in religious exercises and to despise in some degree the ordinary business of life. But I have for some time past been coming to juster and more stable views. I had another conversation with Mr. Bruce about a week ago. I was as much as on the former occasion delighted with him, and I trust edified. He had two admirable discourses last Sabbath yesterday, and the one a lecture from the 7th and the 8th verse of the 6th of Matthew, and the other from Ephesians, 3rd chapter, 12th verse, in whom we have boldness, etc., they were both very much suited to my state, and I trust I was much benefited by them. Mr. Moody and I are on the most intimate terms. He is one of the few that live near to God. If the Lord spare us all, I look forward to the happiest meeting that ever we have had. We are now, my dearest sisters, linked together by a new tie, being members of the same body and the children of the Almighty, our Father in Heaven. But till then, let us pray daily to Him for one another, and seek a nearer communion with him, to whom we have access with confidence by the blood of Jesus. Let not the question be with us, how near must we be to him in order to ensure our safety? But how much communion can be possibly obtained to while here on earth? This is not our home, for we are dead in our life, it is hid with Christ in God. When he who is our life shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. What a hope is this, that our eyes shall see him, and that we shall dwell with him forever and ever. And now makes intercession, he now makes intercession for us at the Father's right hand. May we be kept by the power of God through faith and through salvation. Let us have but one object in view, the kingdom of heaven and all other necessary things shall be added unto us. All things shall work together for the eternal good of them, that love God, and we must wait upon the Lord that he may give us this love. There is no object in this world, the contemplation of which is an adequate employment for that immortal and divine principle in us. The soul, except the character of the Lord of hosts, with the contemplation of which, although we were to devote our entire lives, yet would we be compelled to exclaim, Thou art past finding out, and this is the God to whom we approach with so little humility and contrition of soul. How wonderful that he should not only listen to us when we call on him, but condescend to walk in us by his Holy Spirit, exciting us to draw near unto him. We ought to strive to bring our fellow creatures to a knowledge of their state and of the mercy that is freely offered them. It is truly an awful thought 
that any one to whom the gospel is proclaimed should go down to that lake that burneth with fire and brimstone forever. People are apt to think themselves independent creatures and that none has a right to their services. But if we do not take God's mercy in Christ Jesus, we must take his wrath. I pity most of all those whom we call decent people who, although they will hardly believe it, are in as, as unsafe a state as the openly um, sinner, as they do not build on Christ as the foundation. The collar is going on here, though slowly, and I hope we may all be mercifully spared. But let us endeavor to say, from the heart, the will of the Lord be done. I have a letter to, to ready, which I expect to have an opportunity of forwarding this week. Let us pray earnestly for him, that the Lord would open his heart to the truth, that we may all go on together to that blessed country to which Christ has purchased an admittance for all who trust and in and follow him. I cannot tell you all, nor any of my thoughts on paper, but wait for a meeting with you, if the Lord will. Till then, farewell. I remain, your dear, I remain, my dear sisters, your truly affectionate brother, William C. Burns. He remain, remained still for a short time in the office of his uncle, who had already formed an exalted estimate of his ability and aptitude for business, and of his prospects for future success, and who parted with him with unfinged regret. In the course of the summer, he returned to uh, Kilsleth, and by the beginning of November he was once more in Aberdeen to resume the broken th thread of his studies with a view to the ministry of the Church of Scotland. End of the second part of chapter 1.